Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Morgan State workshop on technical overview of decentralized identity featuring Sam Curran from Indicio. Uh, my name is Sean Bohan. I work at Hyperledger. Um, we're part of the Linux Foundation. Um, and we're going to let Tanisha kick it off in one second. But I did want to go through our antitrust policy. Um, the Linux Foundation is a global nonprofit um, for open source. We host Linux, we host Hyperledger projects, we host Kubernetes and lots of other projects. If you have any questions about the antitrust policy, uh, please contact company counsel, or if you're a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew Updegrove of the firm Gesmer Updegrove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. And also this meeting is held under the, um, all are welcome in the Hyperledger community. These are our community standards, um, and we welcome everybody to this call. Um, Tanisha, would you like to kick us off? And then I will do a quick thing and then we'll turn it over to Sam. And Tanisha can't unmute. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Be good now, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I just want to welcome everyone for attending the technical overview of decentralized identity. Um, a special thank you to Hyperledger, um, Shobohan, um, Rod Jones, and David Boswell. Um, we are associate members of the Hyperledger community, and it has been a wonderful partnership. Um, thank you to our whole network for attending today, and welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome everybody once again to this um, technical overview of decentralized identity. Um, as I mentioned before, Hyperledger is part of the Linux Foundation. We are working with Tanisha and the Morgan State team on a number of sessions like this around different topics. We're kicking it off with decentralized identity starting last week with the intro and this week with the technical overview. Um, this is not going to be a hands-on workshop. This is more going to be a really high-level overview, but we do have lots of three and four hour workshops on our YouTube, and there is an active, vibrant community on our Discord and within the Hyperledger community for folks who want to get involved. The last thing I want to mention is that we do have the Hyperledger Mentorship Program uh, happening this year. Um, I'm going to include the links and put them into chat in a second. And um, But basically, our mentorship program, it's kind of like an internship, but um, Mentorship candidates will um, propose a project. If their proposal is accepted, they are partnered up with a um, experienced senior developer or maintainer on the project that they want to work with uh, within the Hyperledger community. And then they get to work on that project uh, between, uh, I believe it's going to be May through August of this year. Um, the proposal date or the, the the end date for proposals is March 15th. So we only have you know about two weeks for that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Sam, but welcome everybody. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Sam Curran. He is a maintainer. He's a senior member of the Hyperledger community. Uh, he and I worked together years and years and years ago. So he's been around the block quite a bit. Um, and I really want to thank him and the Indicio team for stepping up and uh, putting on this workshop for the Morgan State and the Hyperledger community. And Sam, it's all yours. Thanks, Sean. Uh, glad to be here. I am Sam Curran. I'll be your tour guide today as we talk about uh, decentralized identity stuff. I am very, very happy to answer questions or to uh, help explain things um, to uh, to increase your understanding and learning. So um, Sean, is the is, is questions into chat? Is that how we're doing this? Are we going to do questions today? Yeah, let's let's put let's put questions in the chat, and we're going to roll this way, folks. We're going to let Sam do his presentation, and then we're going to do Q and A uh, towards the end. Put your questions into chat, and um, if it can be answered in chat, someone might. We have some Indicio folks and, and community members here, but for the most part, if it's not answered in chat, I will be playing MC later on and and quizzing Sam on uh, on the discussion we're about to have. Absolutely. With your questions. Uh, uh, excellent. So um, I am. Uh, I work for a company called Indicio. Um, uh, we help uh, folks with uh, decentralized identity and uh, and making all that ha uh, all, all the magic happen. Uh, I am Telegram Sam on all the socials. Uh, if you would like to uh, connect with me or ask me a question, 
um, in my direct community, there's a handful of hats that I wear, um, but the, the two main ones that relate to our topic today is I'm a co-chair of two different working groups. One is the Hyperledger Aries working group. I'll, I'll talk about Aries in a little bit and what that is, uh, as well as the Decentralized Identity Foundation's uh, uh, DIDCOM working group. And so I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and um, I have a handful of things to show on, on different stuff. And so I, I'm not just showing slides here. Um, and that's why you see all of my browser um, as it is. But um, we will um, we'll, we'll jump through and talk about uh, the, different, uh, the different stuff. One of the things that I want to mention, uh, Hyperledger obviously is an, is an open source uh, community. And uh, so are lots of the other organizations that I'll be talking about today. Lots of open source code. Uh, there's a handful of huge advantages with with open source projects, including the fact that you get to go read the code uh, behind the, the the software that uh, that you can use. It's also it generally has very permissive licensing in in the sense that you can use these projects to um, to accelerate your your own uh, efforts or your own projects um, to learn. There's there's uh, no licensing uh, involved with with any of this, and so you can jump in with any of the things that I'm talking about today in in a really nice way. In addition, uh, not all, but most of the communities that we're talking about are uh, are relatively um, um, open to uh, students in particular or others that want to learn, but people that are independent that would like to be involved in these organizations. And so um, there's there's lots of, of ways to get involved. Um, Hyperledger uh, is a significant player in the decentralized identity community. Um, the uh, there are three main projects with a with a fourth bonus one, which we have, which is new this year. Um, and so we're going to talk about Hyperledger Aries, Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Ursa, and the new Hyperledger Anon creds, uh, and the the types of um, and the types of uh, things that each of these provide and and, and what they give to us. Um, with a with a brief high level overview provided by Scott that I think was last week, um, my goal is to sort of fill in and talk about some some of the projects that 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 um, that fill in the underpinnings of, of all the things that he was talking about. Uh, and so that's that's what I'm going to, to cover a little bit today. Um, we will, there's a lot of links on these slides. Uh, you don't have to rapidly try and type them before I change the slide. We'll go ahead and, and share these um, so that you can just click on the links on the slides instead of um, instead of trying to, to do that. Um, you can also generally Google these things uh, with the words that you see on the slides real quick and find the same information. So it, it's, it's generally not super hard to discover. So uh, here's the logos of these projects that I was talking about. Uh, here's some links, and I'll talk about what each of these things do. Um, Ares is a project that is focused on what we call identity agents. So these are um, uh, pieces of uh, software uh, that allow or assist users or organizations in, in involving all of the things related to decentralized identity. Uh, specifically, the, it's their responsibility to, to do all the stuff that doesn't happen on a ledger. And that turns out to be most of what happens in decentralized identity is not on a ledger. But we do need a few things on a ledger and there's useful uh, things for that. And that's where the Hyperledger Indy project comes in. Um, Indy um, was, was uh, the first um, and still the only uh, purely identity focused ledger that we have uh, in the world. And, and it does a, an excellent job with that. Uh, having it very focused on identity, avoid some of the complications uh, that that arise with, uh, for example, ledgers that have uh, that have a, a transaction cost for um, for writing individual transactions, or uh, or the lack of governance that can be a problem in, in in certain ecosystems. Those sorts of things are well solved by Indy. Ursa is a cryptography library that was also born out of these projects, but can be used independently and uh, has a lot of the crypto cryptographic libraries and the primitives inside it that uh, that are relied on in the in the other projects it's a, a generally a bad idea to attempt to roll your own cryptography it's really easy to make mistakes and so whenever possible you want to use a library to help you do that and ursa is an excellent one for that the new anon creds project is also born out of out of the indie ecosystem and uh, but uh, but but moving beyond that, uh, non-creds is the uh, is the gold standard in privacy preserving credentials. Um, there's lots of credential technologies that exist, and a non-creds uh, is one that is in deployment and has uh, has a handful of, of privacy preserving features that are uh, gradually being uh, worked towards in a, a, with other technologies, but they're not there yet. And so uh, a non-creds is a great project to help uh, folks understand that. Uh, there's a there's an effort underway uh, to define the next version of a non-creds and, and the types of features that, that it will include and there's there's active conversations going on in those in those areas so these are the the hyperledger specific 
identity projects. Now, I happen to be involved a lot in Aries, and so you get to hear a little bit more about Aries. Um, the, there are a handful of code bases uh, within Aries to, to help you build identity agents or software. Uh, there's lots of names that we use. A wallet is one of them, um, or agent uh, is another one uh, that, uh, that, that describes the roles that, uh, that this software uh, plays. Um, and there, here's a handful, not all of them, but, the, but uh, some main projects inside of the, the Aries ecosystem. Um, the Aries, Aries is, is uh, large. We have, um, we have about five or six weekly or biweekly calls on various topics or various projects, including there's a weekly sort of main Aries community call on Wednesdays uh, that kind of summarizes and, and, and it's kind of a central meeting place for everything. But, but all, all the, uh, lots of real work happens in all of those other calls um, it, uh, as, it, uh, as it works together. Um, so, uh, question from the chat: Indy is a, is a blockchain uh, itself. It is a it is a blockchain ledger, um, and so it anchors specific assets uh, to them. I'll talk in a minute. I don't have a good visual for this, but I'll talk uh, in a minute about the role that the ledger actually plays, um, and and how that actually uh, makes it work. But uh, we will. I'll get there in just a second. Uh, so, in Hyperledger Aries, um, there there's a handful of, of code bases. The, the three main ones uh, that, that are very active are Aries Cloud Agent Python uh, and the Aries Framework JavaScript are two um, code bases that can be uh, that can help you uh, write software that issues and verifies and holds credentials. Um, the uh, AFJ uh, Aries Framework JavaScript is actually the underpinnings of the bifold mobile wallet, um, and the uh, and, and so it, it's, it's built on top of that. The Bifold Mobile Wallet is a React Native-based project uh, that can be built for both iOS and Android that, that allows you to use those, those features in AFJ uh, to produce a mobile experience for, for people to, to be involved in the ecosystem. And then Asgar is an important piece you never see, uh, but it's a secure storage that lives underneath uh, uh, these projects and, uh, and, and provides uh, key management and, and ties in with the cryptography and the other necessary things as it happens. So Aries as a project was born out of Indy, uh, but was but 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 uh, was spun out specifically to serve more than just Indy. And so there are uh, other ledgers and did methods and credential types um, that that uh, didn't originate within Indy. Within Indy are within the scope of Aries, and so it can be used with other ledgers, um, any Indy ledger, but also other ledgers, uh, other did methods and other credential types. Um, and, uh, and, and there are the growing support as, uh, as the community builds those into these, these code bases to support lots of different types of these things. So that's what Aries is. Um, I spent a lot of time with Aries. Uh, I, it, uh, it has a lot of uh, success in deployments and interoperability between projects, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and one of the, I'll talk a, a minute about a DIDCOM, which is another technology that was, that was spun out of Aries, but not into a Hyperledger project and it landed over the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So uh, some applause is due Hyperledger here for the, for the good support of these projects and helping us to, to be in, engaged in this work and, and supporting our efforts. They have been excellent hosts for this work. Uh, they, they are not the only organization that exists in this ecosystem, and so I want to highlight a few of the other organizations and what they're involved with um, and, and, how they're, and, and what they contribute. The Decentralized Identity Foundation, or the DIF, uh, was uh, has been around for years and um, and, and uh, supports a number of efforts, including a lot of work with uh, with uh, claims and credentials and identifiers and discovery. Um, there's uh, not listed here is a is a newer effort around um, uh, around trust establishment or trust registries and and uh, including efforts to to combine that work with an effort a similar effort from the Trust Over IP Foundation. Uh, so the DIDCOM working group is one of the groups that I'm a chair of over at the DIF, and DIDCOM is a is a secure way of communicating between two parties that have DIDs, and so it allows for um, oh awesome, there's a the, a nice dump of of links there uh, in the chat. The um, the uh, DIDCOM provides a a, a really useful uh, feature uh, um, that that helps tie together communities. I'll talk about this in a minute, um, and uh, and we can discuss that. Um, how does this fall into end product wallet that would be EITIS2? What are your thoughts for open wallet? That's a good question. Um, and I think I may actually not have a slide for open wallet here because they're, they're relatively new in the sense that they were organized uh, earlier this week formally. <laughs> and so, um, and so that's a, th those are very relevant questions. So I will talk to that, but I don't have a slide uh, specifically prepared for, for the open wallet foundation. Um, 
So the Decentralized Identity Foundation supports lots of working groups and lots of uh, lots of things that are happening here, um, and and uh, they're an important player in the ecosystem. They have uh, some of their groups are IPR protected, which means that you can, you can only contribute to those groups if you are a member and you sign the right um, and you sign the right uh, agreements, so that there are no intellectual property challenges with the with the, the work that goes on at the diff. Um, there are other groups that are that are open and free to attend uh, because they lack the same focus and therefore the, don't have the same IPR requirements. Um, another group uh, that's actively involved is Trust Over IP. They were involved with uh, with a project called uh, Good Health Pass. They're also um, well known for a layer model that they have produced, uh, a four layer uh, model that, that's quite useful. Um, and then they have uh, the, also the work in governance and that relates to the, the trust establishment, uh, trust registry work that I spoke of earlier, which addresses the issue of which, uh, of which issuers you should trust for which credentials as expressed by existing authorities. And so that's a, that's a useful piece uh, there as well. We also have the W3C Community Credential Group. Um, they are the the, or the originating uh, body of the DID Core spec, which of course we rely on, and as well as the W3 Credential uh, format, um, which is um, the sort of a, a focal point for uh, the development of credential technologies. There's a, a new 2.0 effort underway as well for the W3C credentials, um, and the, the, that's an ongoing discussion. Um, it's the I get this question a lot. People say, "Is a non-creds compliant with the with the W3 the the W3C credential data format?" Um, the answer is mostly, uh, and 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 the the reason for that answer is that the non-creds uh, effort or the 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 use of a non-creds existed prior to the standardization of that spec, and so the 2.0 effort that's underway in a non-creds now will definitely include alignment with the credential format uh, moving forward. Um, and so the missing slide that I don't have is for the Open Wallet Foundation, and, and that's a really good question. Um, the Open Wallet Foundation is, a, is the newest organization to arrive on the scene, and they are also under the Linux Foundation, which is helpful. Lots of these organizations, not all of them, but lots of them are under the Linux Foundation umbrella. And the Open Wallet uh, uh, effort is, is designed to, to create and promote open source code bases around uh, wallets uh, that would also qualify under areas of what we call an agent. And um, and then uh, and those concerns. Um, what you think goes in a wallet primarily depends on what uh, where you came from. Uh, so if you came from a cryptocurrency perspective, a wallet is where you store the the keys and, uh, related to in the, in the data surrounding cryptocurrency. From an identity perspective, um, you generally store uh, I, uh, keys that relate to identifiers such as DIDs and the verifiable credentials that you have either been issued that you have uh, verified from others or that you are holding yourself as the subject of those credentials. Um, it also gets into things like, uh, like payment. Uh, for example, um, wallets on mobile devices uh, often hold information about credit cards uh, to be used at payment terminals um, and, the, and the interactions and protocols surrounding those, um, as well as things like keys. So opening up your car um, with a credential that you hold or opening a door locker or things like that um, also heavily relate there. And so there's a lot that can go into a wallet. Uh, that's, a, that's a long and, and, and sort of open uh, conversation about what the scope ought to be. The Open Wallet Foundation has been talked with a lot, um, but, uh, but it has just been formally organized, I believe on Tuesday. Uh, if, if, uh, if someone has a better date for that, please correct me, but it's been very recent in the sense that there's been lots of efforts to organize it and lots of uh, fanfare, if you will, but because the organization has, uh, has only briefly or recently popped into existence, the discussions that we've been able to have sort of under the, the future envelope, if you will, of the Open Wall Foundation have been largely theoretical um, because we haven't been able to actually perform anything as, a, as an organization yet. Um, and so... The question was asked, uh, was asked, how does the Open Wallet Foundation relate to Ares and what happens to Ares uh, now that we have the Open Wallet Foundation? That is a very large open question. Uh, j last week, um, I gave a presentation to the um, sort of the pending or early formed uh, the, the Open Wallet Foundation Architecture Task Force outlining the, what Ares has, the things that we've learned, the various uh, projects in it, and um, and that question was also asked there. It's the question on everyone's mind. Um, and th there isn't a clear answer yet. Um, it, uh, the, the ARES effort has been going for years uh, and, and lots of progress has been made there. Um, there are certainly opportunities for 
uh, areas to use uh, uh, output or, or projects created by the Open Wallet Foundation. It's also possible uh, that the community might decide to, to transfer or to shift um, elements of ARIES uh, over to the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, all of those things are potential, and there have been no formal proposals made there. Um, there have been formal proposals made to transfer uh, some libraries that support DIDCOM v2, developed in the, in the Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, over to the Open Wallet Foundation um, as part of a, 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 an initial step forward. That, uh, that is a little bit uh, of a sister project to, to ARIES, and so it doesn't relate to it directly, but, uh, but it is an indication that there, there is interest in being involved. It's uh, when new organizations arrive on the scene, there's a little bit um, uh, of um, there's a little bit of sort of figuring out how organizations work together and what, what types of things each of them will cover. Um, and that has certainly not yet been completed with the Open Wall Foundation, but, but uh, there's, uh, there's leaders in all those organizations talking together to sort of sort some of those things out. Um, and, so, and so that's an important bit there. Uh, Angela Maria asked, do Aries Cloud Agent and Aries Framework JavaScript serve the same purpose? Just the languages are different, or are they something entirely different? Um, uh, thank you for your question, that's a great one. Um, the, um, they are very similar in overlap. Um, uh, Aries Cloud Agent Python existed, uh, was one of the first larger projects within Aries. Um, and so it has some historical uh, benefit of being around a little bit longer. Aries Framework JavaScript is a very active community that, that, that is growing um, and they are entering the phase of development where they're starting to, to, to in some ways slow down very active development um, as, they, as they reach a little bit more maturity. So uh, AFJ is a younger project, um, Akapai is an older project. Uh, they, they both have very similar functions and, in fact, are often tested against each other for, for protocol compliance and compatibility. So um, they, are, they are very similar in that nature. Um, there's a little bit of, of, of course, deployment differences. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to use Python as an underpinning for a mobile app, um, but, but with, uh, with frameworks like React Native, that is possible with JavaScript. Um, and so the, it plays a different role uh, there, but they, they are largely... Um, uh, very similar to each other in, in, the, in the nature of the projects. Um, there are, there's another project that's built in Go um, and, and a handful of other smaller ones. Uh, I just highlighted sort of the main ones here. Um, and so there, there's, there's definitely other places to start from if you're interested or, or you have a, a preferred language. Um, switching out of uh, Aries just a little bit, DIDCOM itself is, uh, it has lots of, of library support in various languages um, that, uh, that, that uh, helps to, um, you know, um, helps to provide the support for whatever platform you might happen to be on. Um, uh, so other questions. To support a VC-based login to website like OIDC, uh, OIDC today, um, are there existing SDKs? Uh, Aries Framework JavaScript um, has some initial support for OpenID for VC, which is the OpenID Connect-like um, uh, protocol for, for logging into existing websites. Um, there's also developing technology within DIDCOM that, uh, that uh, handles uh, similar things. Um, uh, DIDCOM uses uh, uh, a message-based architecture with authenticated encryption. What that means is that if you, when you, in the process of sending an encrypted message to another party, you're also proving your own key ownership in a way that is similar to but not exactly like signing. Um, which allows for the other party to be sure that you own keys. And so there are some, um, some growing opportunities with that as it relates to websites as well. Um, but, uh, but lots of these things are relatively new in development. Uh, sort of the most popular thing, although it's a relatively young technology, is OpenID for VC, which is, a, is not, it's not exactly OpenID Connect, but was built out of the same roots. Um, and so uh, that is quite a popular uh, thing for support today. And I did mention that, that Aries Framework JavaScript has initial support for that. Um, so, uh, also, what are the high-level architecture of an identity wallet look like um, built with open source? Um, I, let me see. I don't think I have slides for that, but I could find one real quick. There is... Um, There's so much, so much to pull from that I was a little unsure of what I should actually combine uh, into um, into all of this, and so I do apologize for that. Um, it's going to be slightly disheveled as I as I hunt down the right answers. Um, um, 
let's see, this is the presentation I believe I'm looking for. This was the presentation that we actually gave to the Open Wall Foundation, um, and there are some architecture slides in here that are useful. Um, this is the architecture slide provided by uh, Aries Framework JavaScript in that call. Um, and so uh, to credit to the creators of these slides, uh, this was Timo Glastra uh, from Animo uh, that created this particular one. Um, and so there's uh, AFJ itself is not a full application. It's not ready to ship uh, exactly that you have to sort of build logic and other concerns on top of it. Um, and but but the, this is the main area of, of various framework JavaScript and there are modules to handle various things um, for uh, different uh, didcom protocols, for example, that are supported. You'll see the open ID for VC client down here as, a, as another module um, that it contains. It handles uh, some some transportations and, and, and messaging of that. Also, uh, the, the the repository layer here. They're not talking about a code repository. They're talking about a VDR, a verifiable data, data registry, or often a ledger. Um, and so and so it's responsible for communicating there as well. There's a handful of underlying libraries as well uh, that they lean on. For example, there is an open open ID for VC uh, JavaScript library that they're using. Here's one for JSONLD uh, BBS plus signatures. Here's the Aries ASCAR library and in Indie VDR, uh, as well as uh, uh, on an on Rust implementation uh, for, for there, as well as the DID resolver here for resolving DIDs to the, their associated DID documents. So here's an architecture uh, slide for that. Um, Aries ASCAR here, uh, they, they listed it by name, but that's the secure storage that we think of sort of the internal wallet for the, for the code base um, that provides uh, key storage and the cryptography necessary to um, to do things like uh, signing or encrypting messages um, and, and is involved too in the preparation of verifiable credentials. Similarly, he, that's, uh, here's a, a very high level architecture of Aries uh, Cloud Agent Python. Um, the framework itself is what Akapai is, and that includes a sort of core Aries functionality, um, and including uh, DIDCOM protocol support. They also have an administrative API um, that allows you to build a controller um, in any language that you would like that handles the business logic pieces of running an agent. And then, uh, so for example, uh, if the, the, the framework itself contains all of the information to issue a credential, but the information that is contained in the credential and who you ought to be issuing it to is a business logic concern that is handled within the controller that you pair up with, with, uh, with, uh, with Akapai. And so um, that allows for custom business logic for your particular use case, but leaning on the functionality that exists within uh, the Akapai uh, architecture as it exists. Um, and, then, and then of course that provides nice sort of testable compatibility with other projects. And I think those are the two architecture diagrams. Um, I have another one here, but that's something entirely different. That's a, that's a testing uh, piece of infrastructure that we have in the, in the Aries ecosystem. Um, and so, these are probably a little bit too uh, um, too detailed. Uh, it would be useful to uh, have a um, an overall uh, architecture of that. Um, uh, because I'm presenting from a handful of different slide decks, I can attempt to provide links. Uh, lots of these have been publicly shared already, so it's possible to do so. Um, and uh, so I, I will attempt to provide all of these slides um, uh, as part of the the presentation here, and that way they're they're available for review. That would be awesome, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, it'll be a little bit of a challenge. I'm jumping around a little bit because I love questions and I'd really like to, to, to answer them as directly as I can. So I this do is, appreciate the No, no, no. This is great. And we do appreciate the questions. And Sam, um, I will take the links you provide as well as the link to a wiki page we're setting up on the Hyperledger wiki for this presentation. It'll be on the Hyperledger YouTube uh, page for this video. So we're going to have the links in the, com in, in, the, in the commentary for the video as well so folks can find it. Excellent. So another excellent question. Um, are there test suites that we can use to test the implementation um, of, of different standards? Yes, except that it's really uh, because the standards originate from different places in the community, there's not a central place that has test suites for all the things. Um, one of the projects that um, that Aries has is what we call an Aries agent test harness. And what that does is it provides the ability to um, to test agents against each other. So for example, uh, Akapai with, um, with, uh, with Aries Framework JavaScript and run through scripts with, uh, with predicted outcome so that, you can, uh, so that you can test and verify the expected functionality. So 
um, there's a, here's a here's a description of of what the how the tests are actually kind of written um, to to provide this uh, you know to to script two agents. This doesn't specify which agent is which or which software they're using, which allows to, to test all of these directions. And, uh, and the, the test results are regularly rolled up into some output that we use within the Aries ecosystem to kind of see where compatibility is uh, between various projects. Um, and, so, uh, and so there, there are standards there. Um, and uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Akapai can, can interact with other ledgers. Um, it depends on the support that's built. So if it's if it's one that doesn't already have support, then that's harder. Um, there um, there is uh, support for some ledgers, uh, but not all of them, as there's lots of ledgers. So it it uh, ends up being um, tied mostly to who's willing to do the work to to provide the necessary translation piece um, to to make that happen. Uh, someone asked earlier, I lost the question, uh, but they asked about how this uh, or how Indie relates to Fabric. Um, Indie, uh, I, I can, uh, I'll give you some high level and then a couple of details. Um, uh, Indie is very identity focused and Fabric is, is designed uh, as a more general purpose ledger. Um, and so um, Indie does not have smart contracts uh, very deliberately. Um, uh, Fabric does. Um, you can, uh, there are did methods that will allow you to back it with Fabric. Uh, and so it's possible to use Fabric as, as an interaction here. Um, one of the interesting things about identity uses of ledgers is that uh, efforts are taken to keep as much off the ledger as possible for privacy and regulatory reasons, where ledgers like Fabric excel at keeping stuff on the ledger. And so it kind of depends a little bit on the exact use case. We find a lot of folks that, uh, that are using Fabric but want the identity pieces actually ended up, uh, end up using both. They end up using Fabric um, for the Fabric uh, pieces and Indie for the Indie pieces. Uh, and then tying them together when necessary. And that provides the ability to have kind of the right balance between the functionality and the privacy that they're looking for. Um, lots of fabric ledgers are internal. And so it's a, it's a little bit harder to, uh, to see um, or to, uh, they're not always public, uh, which means that, uh, that it also relates in interesting ways to identity systems, which is very helpful if your identity can be resolved, generally speaking, and not only within a private ecosystem. Um, so uh, another indie question, this is really good. Based on the previous intro video, there are concepts of schema and definitions residing uh, in, in the system. Where are the schema and definition uh, corresponding uh, on the system and, and what do they mean, how do they run? Um, um, I'm gonna guess at a URL and I might be wrong here. That's not it. Um, Here we go. My second guess was correct. This is a tool called IndieScan. Uh, Indie uh, or Indicio hosts a, a version of this, and, and this will show you what is on an Indie ledger. Um, a schema is the list of attributes that are necessary uh, on uh, to to create a credential. So, for example, uh, this is just very recently written. I'm just I'm pulling one off of off of the top here. Um, and so here is a schema that has been written. Uh, here is the did that, that has written the schema. Uh, and uh, the the idea the ID of the schema um, it, or the transaction is there, um, and this lists three different attributes: uh, primary, firewall, and compress. I have no idea what this is for. I'm just reading uh, live off of the public ledger, and so th this is the attributes that are contained inside of a of a, of a schema. Um, there's also a credential definition, and the credential definition links a schema to an issuer with cryptographic material uh, necessary to um, uh, to issue and verify the credentials. And so uh, just looking at the, at the top here, let's see, there's a bunch of, uh, so, da, da, da. let me see here. So uh, this refers to a schema this is a credential definition. This is a really deep technically, but, uh, but for those of you that are interested, um, this provides the link between the, the schema as provided and, and an individual issuer. Um, and so uh, here is the, here's the issuer that this is being uh, written for. Um, and if you look at the full detail, there are um, the, these are cryptographic keys 
um, that relate to the preparation of, preparation of is each individual attribute, of both for an issuance and the verification of a credential. This allows for the features that, uh, that a non-creds provides. Uh, Indy was the first ledger that, that, that provided the features necessary to, to, to run a CL signature-based um, credential scheme that allows for these, um, for these technologies. And so uh, that allows for selective disclosure, meaning you can uh, only disclose a few of the attributes instead of all of them. Uh, predicate proofs, which allows for comparisons without revealing the actual value, as well as privacy preserving holder binding. And so the, the, this is the, the raw cryptographic material used for each of these fields um, as it relates to the individual issuer that we're, that we're talking about uh, to make that happen. So, um, and so the credential the, the schema includes the, the list of the attributes. The credential definition is a link between the particular schema and an individual issuer with the cryptographic assets necessary to, to make, the, um, uh, to make the, the credential system work with issuance and verification. And so uh, IndyScan is really interesting if you'd like to, to go see what are on the various uh, networks and, and, the, and the assets being written there. Uh, very technical, of course, um, but that's the underpinnings of where it all goes. Uh, so these are recorded on a ledger. Um, and we get asked the question a lot, like, why do you need a ledger? Um, the answer is, is you don't technically, and the, and the next version of an OnCreds will allow you to not use uh, Indy, uh, but also if you, as long as you uh, provide the right features, not even use a ledger at all. So what does the ledger give us and what, why, why do we want to stick stuff on it? Um, we, um, when you have things like schemas and credential definitions, it's important that those are available. Uh, they're highly available and, and, and all the software systems necessary can retrieve them. It's important that they are tamper resistant so that, uh, so that no one can go manipulate the data in a way that allows them to compromise uh, the credentials that have been issued against it. Um, and, um, and it needs to be, uh, you, you need to have a way to, to, to verify that the, um, that the information is in fact from who you think it is. Um, and so uh, there's a couple more reasons, but that's the, that's the high level overview of what you need. So if you uh, plan in the future to, in, to use a credential system without a ledger uh, to, to anchor these assets, it's important that you consider the needs uh, for it uh, to, to make that happen. Um, what does each ring, rectangle box you show just mean? Is it a ledger, a node, a user, and a blockchain or not? This is just a, a record. So in these here, uh, this is a record written to the particular ledger we're looking at, which is the Indicio testnet. And so this is a, a more of a, of, a, of a terse view of the same thing. Um, and then this is the, the actual raw ledger record itself um, is, in the, is in the box down here below. It's quite long. You can see the cryptographic key material and the, and the other things that are present here. Um, the other thing that uh, the ledger is involved in is the, is the recording of what's called the revocation registry, which is a privacy preserving way of indicating which credentials have or have not been revoked. And so there's some key material here uh, for the creation of that registry. Um, that's a revocation is a, is a deeper topic, but the, the ledger is also involved um, in a really useful way there. Oh, the previous page with many boxes up here. Um, these are, this is simply some of the information pulled out of the, of the data here to kind of indicate what's happening. Um, you know, for example, you have the, the schema ID uh, there that is also present up here. And so that's just there. Uh, is that the diagram you mean, uh, or is there a different one you're, you're speaking of? Page with the array of boxes. This one. Um, these aren't ledgers at all. Uh, these are different agents uh, in the particular uh, test environments that we're, that we're working on, uh, or, or that you can, you can test against each other. So um, ARIES agents themselves can use ledgers, but are not ledgers themselves and, uh, and, and, uh, and are, um, are otherwise orthogonal to the, to the involvement of the, in performance of their duties. Um, assets tend, tend to be loaded uh, by agents. Um, off of a ledger to be able to do their job. But other than that, there's, there's not a, a ton of ledger interaction directly. Um, good, awesome questions. Um, so uh, there's lots of projects. I'm looking at the clock here and we have a little bit of time left. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take some, some more open questions as well at the end. But there's another element of open source that I wanted to talk about. I've been involved in open source and, and I'm lucky to be involved with a job that allows me to participate in open source in, in, in really useful ways. Um, Sometimes people ask, why do I get involved in open source communities? Why do I want to be involved? 
Um, uh, you are, of course, welcome to just use the assets uh, according to the, the licenses that exist within open source projects. And I'm sure many of you do that if you've uh, if you've imported, uh, you know, node modules or Python libraries that are often written by other other folks and, and available as open source. And, and, the, and all of us do that a lot. Um, but being involved in, in the efforts behind those open source projects um, can be really powerful uh, and they can provide you, you with some additional benefits. Um, and, and one here, I've, I'm not going to read everything on, on the slides, of course, but uh, one of the things that helps with being involved is that you can make a project aware of your use cases that they may not have been, uh, they may not have been aware of. Um, and so uh, being involved there will help you to know um, or help them to know what types of things you're using the library for, which can help them improve the project. It also uh, allows you to get involved with actually fixing issues or adding features to the to the projects that you're involved with. And that's really powerful. And one of the best things about open source is that if there is a problem, you're actually capable of fixing it, not only for yourself, but contributing that back to the community. Lots of open source projects are related to, to relatively uh, fast moving and recent technology. Um, and, and it's 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 uh, more difficult to to keep up um, without the involvement of, of so many people in the community to make that happen. And so the other the other, the other note here is that this isn't just code developers that, that are necessary in open source projects. Lots of them need uh, writers, um, uh, user experience uh, folks that that are that are talented with creating uh, and crafting good user experience. Uh, project manager folks that can help organize efforts and and to be able to kind of serve the community in that way. There's lots of different ways to be involved. Um, and I have, uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit, rearranging my slides. I'd like to talk about uh, how to get involved. I, you know, there's lots of links and communities and groups that we talked about here and the links that ended up in the chat. Um, I'd like to talk about how to be involved in these working groups. Uh, and so I have some tips here about, about how when you connect with a, a project to be able to, to get involved. And these are gonna be a little generic because there's uh, differences even with the communities that we have referred to here um, in, in exactly how they work. But this will help you understand the basics of, of, what's, uh, of what's going on. Um, and um, and uh, uh, so these are general, general things that can apply as you're reaching out or trying to be involved with the group. Um, the first thing you wanna try and figure out is how the group communicates. Uh, is it a mailing list? Uh, is it a working group call? Uh, or do they have a, a, a Slack or um, Rocket Chat is a little less popular, but, but Discord is becoming uh, much more popular recently with, with all of these things. Um, and, uh, and so uh, often they'll have uh, servers that you can join or, or you know, channels that you can ask in. And so understanding how the working group communicates um, is, is effective. Sometimes there is an email list, but it's not very popular and, and more happens elsewhere. So as you look in and try to find these things, uh, looking around will help you, you understand that a little bit better. Um, there's often calls. Uh, these are, can be weekly or biweekly or monthly. And, uh, and the calls are a great time to, to, uh, to discuss things in a more rapid fashion. Um, most uh, calls uh, have both a, an antitrust policy and a code of conduct. Um, the antitrust policy exists for a reason, and it helps to keep um, the, uh, the business elements, the direct business elements out of those calls and, and, and in a way that prevents um, any accusation or, or, um, or, or legal action because of, uh, of, of you know, um, companies uh, trying to, you know, uh, create a monopoly or to, or to organize pricing in such a way that is, that is not uh, conducive with, with, a, with a healthy market. Um, and so um, those are the, there are rules about uh, what you can and can't talk about, but uh, but generally things like pricing or business deals uh, should be should be handled outside of the call. Of course, you can reach out to community members um, or people that you meet in a call, but those discussions should not happen there. Um, the other uh, element is a code of conduct, and this helps us be excellent to each other and to uh, and to help resolve conflicts when they do occur um, within communities. Uh, there's often lots of different per personality types, lots of different cultures. Uh, lots of different backgrounds of folks that are involved and the, and the, the code of conduct for those organizations um, can, can help sort some of those issues out and can provide methods to be able to resolve any conflicts that do exist. Um, Hyperledger, for example, has a code of conduct that applies to all of their calls. You heard Sean refer to that in the beginning of this call. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's, that's true of all, the, all of those calls. Um, and so it's useful to be aware of those. Um, generally, uh, if you avoid business deals and you be kind uh, to, to each other, then, then you, will, you won't have an issue with that. 
um, uh, of, of falling foul of that. Um, if there is another member of the call um, that is um, that is being uh, that is in violation of, of either of the, these two things, then reaching out to community leaders and seeking help is the is the easiest and the fastest way to help resolve those issues. Um, they have they have training and experience in, in dealing with those sorts of things. Uh, luckily, um, at least in the calls that I frequent, these are very uh, uncommon issues. There's a very occasionally something, but uh, but it's not something that we deal with all the time. We really do have excellent uh, excellent community. Um, most groups have a meeting agenda um, where they'll talk about uh, you know they'll they'll outline what they're going to talk about in the call. Those are often published ahead of time. Um, topics are almost always welcome. If there is a related topic that you would like to present to a working group about, um, talking with the, whoever organizes the community and suggesting a topic and being willing to present on something is, is useful. Um, and uh, and so uh, the, the, they definitely love involvement and, and, and would love for you to be involved. Um, different calls have different ways of, of interaction. Sometimes, uh, you know, particularly on smaller calls, folks will just sort of unmute and talk with each other. In, in larger calls, there's often more formal mechanisms to sort of ask or you know raise your hand. Sometimes the like a Zoom raise hand feature can be used. Uh, sometimes there's a formal queue maintained in the chat um, where you you use sort of uh, commands like Q plus or Q minus to add yourself or remove yourself to the queue. Um, and uh, and so that's that's definitely possible. Um, chat is almost always active, and it's a great way to comment or ask questions, um, and, and without disrupting uh, the, the main flow of the meeting. And lots of folks tend to respond in the chat uh, in these in these you know community calls uh, to be able to help that uh, and make that available. Uh, there's usually a calendar of, of meetings or other types of events, and they're generally run by the organization. So Hyperledger has a has a calendar um, uh, that, that lists all the different calls that they have, and so that you can help find the right meeting within their, their overall organization calendar. Those are really useful. Um, they're usually linked to in, in whatever repository or wiki. Uh, they're often can be found on the agenda uh, for what you're uh, what you're talking to. So. Um, so look for a calendar if you would like to be regularly involved in those meetings, um, and that way you can be aware of when they are or if the time shifts or, or something like that. Calendaring, of course, is a technology that's far from perfect, um, and so that doesn't always work out well. You also want to be mindful of the time zone that the, that the, the call might be anchored in. Um, that, uh, that comes in, into specific focus around daylight savings time uh, changes. Um, which happen uh, on, in the northern and the southern hemispheres in opposite directions and at different times. And so that's a little bit challenging. Um, calendaring software like Google Calendar does a pretty good job with this, um, but it, it's worth, if you can, linking to the organization calendar so that you can periodically load that back up and check to see whether the meeting is still when you think it is. Um, and that's really useful. Meetings are often recorded. This is super useful because if you can't make a time, uh, it's inconvenient or you've got something else scheduled, then, um, then you can find and download the recording uh, and, uh, and, and listen to it later. Uh, a perk of this is that you can often, if you use something like VLC, which will allow you to speed up um, the, uh, a video or an audio recording, then you can often listen faster than real time, which is, which is pretty great. So um, look around, uh, they're often, recordings are often posted on the agenda or if you ask, um, then folks will uh, folks will let you know um, where those recordings can be found. Yeah, and um, within the hyperledger context, uh, recordings of meetings and are, are are kept within the wiki. But sessions like this, or workshops, or bigger presentations are on our YouTube. So you can you know if if you want a specific hey what happened in this meeting, that meeting if it was recorded would be the the link to that recording would be on the wiki. If it's, hey, you guys did a big workshop around central bank digital currencies, that would probably be on YouTube as opposed to the wiki. And you can always ask, hey, where can I find this? And, and, uh, and, and folks, including Sean, will be happy to, to point you to the right direction. Um, working groups often uh, are tied to a GitHub repository. If it's a working group about code, that'll of course be the code related there. Um, there's the readme page on the beginning, usually links to meeting information. Um, you can you can look at uh, if you're trying to be familiar with the project, uh, looking at uh, the issues of the pull requests and the commit history of the of the repository can often be very useful. Uh, sometimes there's repositories that are not primarily code focused. Um, within uh, the Aries project, we have an Aries RFCs repository where we put together lots of um, uh, lots of uh, documentation around specific features or design uh, documents, for example. And so, but we still use pull requests and issues and 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 things like that to to be able to solve that. So be familiar with the GitHub repository that that's uh, that's related to all of these. 
Um, we would love you to contribute your code. Um, there's a handful of uh, suggestions here that will help you to do so. Um, you want to mind the code license. There's a handful of code licenses that are um, that are uh, available, such as Apache 2, um, and you want to you want to make sure that you're familiar with those, um, so that you are aware of how you can use the code um, and what you're agreeing to as you commit your contributions back into the repository. The best way to contribute code is to fork the repository um, and then create a branch for your contribution. Um, that will allow you to bundle all of the changes that you are, uh, that you are, are, are suggesting back into a pull request. Um, and the reason why it's useful to do it on a branch in a, in a fork of the repository under your own account is that if there's discussion about uh, changes that should be made prior to committing, um, then it's a lot easier to do so um, if, it, if it's in a branch that you have. Um, if it happens to take a little bit of time, then it, it's possible to do things like rebasing that branch in order to, to bring it uh, more current with, uh, with the, the main, um, the, the main uh, fork or the main branch of, the, of that uh, code in the, in the main original repository. Um, and uh, don't feel like it, this has to be a, a massively significant change. Often things like typos or other types of minor corrections can be extremely useful to the overall code quality in a community. And so it doesn't have to be massive. Um, work with the maintainers of the repository. Uh, sometimes there's uh, requirements to, um, to not decrease uh, code coverage or to add tests related or adjust tests related to the, to the feature that you are, um, you're adjusting. And so be mindful of those um, and, uh, and, and be aware of, of, the, of, the, um, of the often the code scanning that's present in, those, in, in these repositories. Uh, there's also something uh, that most of, the, of these code repositories require known as a DCO or Developer Certificate of Origin. This is why I've, I've, I've mentioned that here. Um, that is a requirement on the commits that, will, that helps to prevent um, licensing issues as it relates. Um, this is a relatively easy thing to set up in preferences in your favorite Git tool, um, but, uh, but mining the, the DCO requirements will, will help your contribution be accepted. It becomes very painful to accept a contribution without that, even though it's a relatively minor thing. And uh, last but, but not least, there's an important uh, encouragement here and guidelines for engaging in the community. Please speak up in, in communities and, and become involved. You're welcome and you are needed. The, these communities are comprised of the people that make them up and, and we need you. That's particularly true if you don't feel like you fit in. If you don't feel like you fit in, it's likely that the community has a gap in your area of experience or your background um, that they're unaware of. And so, and so being, um, uh, you know, speaking up if you feel like you don't fit in is a great way to help folks to, to learn and to grow and it will be good for the overall health of the community. Please be persistent with your contributions. If you would like to contribute something and it feels like uh, it's not getting any attention um, or, or there's, there's something else that's not moving forward in, in a way that's useful, please be, uh, please be persistent. Uh, speak up, ask up, email folks, um, and, and that will help uh, them to be aware of your contribution and, and it can help you guide you in. So in doing so, please be patient with the others that you'll be involved with in the community. We all have stresses in life. Uh, we all might be a little shorter than we intend at times or, or, or not be able to respond very quickly uh, because of things that are either going on with work or in their personal life. We're all people and please be patient and, and allow uh, all of us some, some grace. Having said that, don't put up with bad behavior. If someone is uh, being uh, rude or, or, or very disrespectful or, or in other ways that are, that are obvious violations of the code of conduct, please engage the code of conduct and seek help from, from leaders or other members of the community in order to resolve those issues. Um, we occasionally do have, uh, have issues where, um, where folks are not uh, minding the code of conduct very well and engaging with the code of conduct is the, is the, is the right way to approach that. And if you, uh, if you come to leaders and say, hey, I observed this thing or here's something that happened in a call recording uh, that made me uncomfortable, uh, here's where it's not allowed in the code of conduct. Um, I would, uh, you know, uh, what do we do about this? They will be happy to, to assist you in the resolution of that problem because this isn't healthy for a community. We need all of us um, in order to, to reach our goals. And so please, um, uh, so, so I, have, I realize I have some things that are in semi, uh, occasionally natural tension with each other. Be persistent, but be patient. Don't put up bad behavior. These are the types of things that we need to balance in order to have the, the, the healthy communities that we need. And that's what we're going for. Um, we want all to be welcome. We need you. Um, we need your perspective. We need your understanding of use cases. We need your contributions. 
Um, and so, and I, and I say we in the very general sense, um, I feel safe saying that for all open source projects, uh, that uh, they, they will all be better because of your involvement. And I, ho I hope you will uh, be willing to, to contribute in those ways. So uh, we, um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy in the last couple of minutes to field any questions or comments um, that relate. I'm grateful that we are able to talk about a lot of comments, uh, particularly technical ones in the middle of the conversation. So I'm, I'm really grateful for those questions that have already been asked. Yeah, Sam, fantastic job as usual. Um, we did get to some of the questions. I've got a couple here at the end. Um, Sam Rita asked about providing reference links of Aries Agent SDK in the context of an application. Uh, Sam Rita, if you check the links I've provided a couple of times, we do link to the Aries uh, wiki page, which will get you to GitHub, which will get you to meeting recordings, et cetera. But the second half of his question, of their question, how verifiable credentials are used to make transactions in a distributed ledger? What was the first part of that question? The, the first part was about um, Aries Agent no, the, SDK. Yeah, but, yeah, but the, the first half of the second, sorry. The second half, how verifiable credentials are used to make transactions in a distributed ledger? So the um, I am unaware of, of, a, of a ledger that uses verifiable credentials in the operation of the ledger itself, although that could certainly be done. Um, the uh, signatures are, are always involved, of course, with a, with a ledger to be able to check the origin or, or, or check validity of things. Um, and so uh, generally how it works in the ecosystem is that you record things on the ledger like a did uh, with its associated did document, which contains public keys. And then you would issue a credential using the associated private keys uh, to that identifier, which could then be used to verify the credential. So in this case, it's the ledger supporting the verifiable credential instead of the verifiable credential supporting the ledger. Now, it's conceptually possible that a ledger could be created that uses verifiable credentials at its core, um, but uh, but I'm unaware of one that does that currently. Cool. Uh, can we use Aries Occupy to interact with other ledgers? Uh, you can. Um, it depends on which ledgers have been already had the work done uh, with the what's called the VDR component, or uh, with, there's an indie VDR, and there can be a VDR for other things, um, like, uh, for example, Ethereum is one of the ones that there has been some attention on. And so all it requires is the right technical component to be able to connect Akapai uh, or AFJ, for that matter, with um, with a different ledger. Um, but uh, but the architecture allows for that. Last question before we go, do Aries Cloud Agent Python and Aries Framework JavaScript serve the same purpose and just the language is different or are they something entirely different? Uh, they mostly serve the same purpose. Uh, they are, there are some different languages. Uh, AFJ has the advantage of being a newer project. And so um, there's there's a few small architectural differences there that uh, that come as a side effect of, of just being a, uh, a newer project and being able to learn from those that came before. Um, it's a little... I wouldn't call it unstable. It's a little bit uh, younger in the project life cycle than the life cycle than than uh, Akapai is than Aries Cloud Agent Python. It's been around longer and is relatively stable in what it provides. And so uh, you're uh, of course can use either of them, and they are also largely compatible with each other and certainly strive to be. Um, and so uh, and so yeah. But the short answer is is they they mostly overlap concerns. All righty. It is now the top of the hour. I'm pretty sure there's another call about to start. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this uh, overview of decentralized identity. I'd especially like to thank Sam for doing such a great job in such a short amount of time with so much information. This is fantastic. And thank you to Tanisha and the entire Morgan State team for helping us put this on. We have more workshops coming, uh, seminars, smaller things, an hour at a time on specific topics. And we're going to get a calendar together for that. But thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm going to stop recording. Yes.